Okay, so welcome back to the second video on the function of the uh, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. So far, we've seen that the CFTR has m quite a few functions. Firstly, it functions as a chloride channel. Secondly, it f functions as an ATP channel. Uh, thirdly, it inhibits the ENAC channel by direct contact through the uh, nucleotide binding domain 1 of the uh, CFTR channel, and the ATP that it's released also inhibits this ENAC channel, and finally it also activates this uh, outward rectifying chloride channel down here. Right, okay, uh, so I also now want to, um, I want to finish my salt secretion diagram and I want to add in a few more things, uh, which is that protein kinase A also activates potassium channels, so we'll finish, we'll finish our salt secretion diagram off. For, for now, that will do for our functions of CFTR. There is one more that I want to mention in this video, but I just want to first uh, finish this salt secretion pathway. Uh, so, uh, there are also two important channels down here for moving the potassium basically, uh, which are the cyclic AMP dependent potassium channel. So I'll put cyclic AMP dependent uh, potassium channel. So KC for potassium channel. And basically that is activated by protein kinase A. So there's another function of protein kinase A. And this allows basically the potassium that is coming in, the additional potassium that is coming in through this NKCC to leave basically. Because in the normal membrane equilibrium, you will have normal potassium channels, but basically those normal potassium channels are perfectly in balance with the potassium that is moving into the cell uh, via the sodium potassium ATPase. I'll just label this sodium potassium ATPase. So this is a normal potassium channel that's present in all sorts of cells, and basically potassium leaves the cell through that potassium channel. Uh, but the amount of potassium leaving here is in balance with that amount of potassium coming uh, in through the sodium potassium pump. We are now bringing additional potassium into the cell through this NKCC, so you need to activate more potassium channels. So these cyclic AMP dependent potassium channels is one method for doing that. Uh, the final thing that contributes to um, to salt secretion is this calcium, uh, which activates a calcium activated chloride channel, uh, which I'll put next to the outward rectifying chloride channel. So here's another chloride channel here, which is this calcium activated chloride channel, and as I say, that's going to be activated by the chloride. Uh, sorry, by the calcium. So calcium is going to activate this calcium activated chloride channel, and I'll just label that. So this is uh, the calcium activated chloride channel. And in addition, it's also going to activate another potassium channel to do the same thing as this cyclic AMP dependent potassium channel. So this is a calcium dependent potassium channel. Okay. And overall, what uh, all of these mechanisms succeed in uh, achieving is that chloride is overall going to end up being moved from the basolateral side of this membrane to the apical side of this membrane. That will then uh, that will then produce a negative charge on this side of the membrane. So you've moved chloride from this side to this side. That will produce a negative charge. Once you've got a negative charge, uh, the sodium is going to want to follow, basically. And uh, the way it follows is through the epithelial sodium channels. Now, that might, be, that might feel a little bit contradictory, because, you know, these epithelial sodium channels, haven't we just blocked them off? Uh, but we didn't block them all. We blocked quite a few of them so that, we, uh, so that the need for the NKCC to bring in ca uh, sodium would become apparent. Uh, but we didn't block them all. And now uh, that you've got this electrical potential, sodium will now want to flow through the, uh, will, want to, will want to move through the epithelial sodium channel in the opposite direction to normal. It will want to move from the intracellular domain to the extracellular domain. Usually, sodium wants to move from the extracellular uh, compartment to the intracellular compartment. So, um, uh, so what's happened is that by the moving the chloride over here and producing the negative charge over here, you've reversed uh, the direction in which sodium wants to move. Uh, and now it will move through the epithelial sodium channel and you'll overall get sodium chloride on this side and then water will move by osmosis. So you overall secrete salty water, basically. So that's the uh, mechanism of uh, secretion of salt and how important CFTR is in that mechanism. Right, uh, okay, the final thing I want to discuss about CFTR is that we think, 
Uh, although very little is understood about this, we think it must be important in vesicle trafficking. So if I draw an epithelial cell here, vesicle trafficking means you create vesicles full of uh, contents that you want to secrete onto the apical surface of your cell. So basically you want the vesicle to come up here and you want uh, it to fuse with the membrane, so something like this, and you want the contents of that vesicle, which I'll just draw as pink dots, you want those pink dots to be released onto the apical surface of the membrane. That's called um, exocytosis, that process. So you want exocytosis of the vesicular contents. Exocytosis, that's that's not good. Cytosis. Right. We think CFTR must be very important in guiding these vesicles up to the apical side of the membrane. The reason is that people with cystic fibrosis, with mutations in the CFTR um, protein, uh, so, for instance, the Delta F508 mutation that we studied in the previous video, uh, they show reduced vesicle trafficking. So uh, one, of the pro one of the contents of vesicles uh, that is often released onto the apical surface of epithelia is a protein called mucin. So mucin is a protein uh, that underlies, um, so it if you, it underlies basically what snot is. Uh, so um, it's a protein that sort of aggregates together and makes a sticky goo. Uh, and it's very important for trapping bacteria in. So for instance, we line our, our, our airways with mucin uh, and the bacterium gets stuck in it. And then the mucociliary escalator uh, gradually lifts the mucin up. And then it's lifted all the way up to the um, to the laryngopharynx and then finally it's swallowed down and goes to the stomach and the bacterium burn. Um, but, um, so, um, but basically in people with cystic fibrosis there is much decreased mucin secretion and we think that, and you know, all, they, all that we can find that is wrong is that the CFTR protein has this mutation and we think uh, therefore well, that's, that's how we've deduced that CFTR must somehow affect uh, vesicle trafficking. So mucin is an example. There's also other things that are secreted. And an example are there are loads of antibacterial proteins that we produce, so proteins that are going to attack bacterium. Uh, so the bacterium firstly are going to get stuck in the mucin. And to make matters worse for the bacterium, we're going to have all sorts of proteins that are going to attack them uh, in, the muc in the secretion as well. So antibacterial proteins are often secreted uh, through exocytosis of vesicles. Uh, and basically, in, also in people with cystic fibrosis, you see greatly reduced antibacterial proteins. So, for instance, IgA is something that we often secrete in mucus, and you see greatly decreased IgA levels in uh, people with cystic fibrosis. So, uh, there are... Uh, that's the other function we think must somehow be related to CFTR, that it must somehow promote uh, vesicles. So I'll draw the final line, that it must somehow promote this vesic vesicular trafficking, basically. Um, but we don't have an, at, at all a good understanding of how yet, and uh, this is obviously an area of uh, current research.